Wes Berry, uh, the uh, leader of the Land Institute out in Salina, Kansas, uh, was given the Brumfield Award a few years ago. And he came to Malabar Farm, and, uh, and I talked with him. And um, the big project he's working on right now is developing perennial crops, uh, you know, perennial corn, and, and your standard standard crops. He thinks that, uh, that they have a, a form of perennial sweet corn uh, within a few years of being ready to go market and sold uh, for farmers, uh, to farmers. Um, and he compared this to a typical um, uh, annual plan um, by showing this big this big banner he hung from the rafters of the big barn there in Malabar and dropped it down. Uh, and on this life-size uh, poster, the roots for you know, typical corn plant go down just a little ways. For the perennial plant that they're developing, six times long, that makes a tremendous difficulty in what it's able to pull out of the ground and, you know, it's the the upper layer is not constantly being depleted. Um, so I think this is something that could have a major impact in the world. And it was Bromfield who, who uh, sent him in that direction. I asked him if he thought that a change to full complete conservation can be made without major disruption and problems in the world. And he said he hopes so. He hopes that humans don't prove to just be bacteria in a petri dish growing wildly out to the edge until suddenly it can't go anymore and it all just dies off. And I hope that the Brownfield's impact at least helps move things in that direction. Uh, I want to close with a little poem from uh, the writer Wendell Berry, who is uh, involved in both poetry and uh, talking about conservation and agriculture. And this is in his most uh, recent book, Leavings. We forget the land we stand on and live from. We set ourselves free in an economy founded on nothing, on greed verified by fantasy, on which we entirely live. We depend on fire that consumes the world without lighting, to this dark blaze driving the inert metal of our most high desire, to offer our land as fuel, thus offering ourselves at last to be burned. This is our riddle, to which the answer is a life none of us have lived. And that's what Brownfield was able to do. So now, 50 plus years after Brownfield's death, people are starting to say, hmm, maybe he was on to something after all. <laughs> Thanks. One culture. Kind of like Rome, after it went out and fell, it's still a culture, a Rome culture. And I, I think. I think when a field archaeology will substantiate that, in all my work I do is a shocking challenge. Oh, so if I'm not doing my poetry, I'm doing my archaeology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. worlds. Okay. Okay. Well, people had to come from somewhere. Well, they, they did. And you know what's cool? And that's one of the things I've been to mention is that with this discovery of a thing called DNA, now we can take skeletal remains and we can go backwards in time. And we're looking at the movement of people into um, North America. And we're finding that it really wasn't the Asia Minor where everybody said it was. There was a small influx of people across that area. But the big flow is Africa, South America, and up. And um, that's really interesting. And, and all the DNA is pointing that way. With a little bit, you know, coming in from the, the Asian, uh, whatever, and Iceland region across that way. So. But it really um, uh, nixes what the Native Americans are saying, and they say they own all, all of the uh, prehistoric artifacts of North America, of Ohio, belong to them, but it doesn't, their bloodline doesn't line up. 
their DNA doesn't line up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a great thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> well, it is. And, and there's nothing simple about it. Anytime you involve multiculturals, uh, living styles and peoples and beliefs, it gets very complicated. But here's the key. Canada figured it out. They still honor and love and cherish their native Canadians. And they're all part of Canada. Yeah. yeah. We have America as a part of Canada, yeah. <laughs> And that's, that's a sad thing, because well, we, we missed know, out on a tremendous amount of culture. It was, you know, people being together. I don't think people should throw a lot of blame around the most of the Jesus. I don't think they do. <laughs> well, I mean, some people do. <laughs> We're going to start over here in about two or three minutes on the uh, mound builders, Ohio's archaeology, and the environmental impacts on Ohio's archaeology. About two minutes, two or three minutes. Well, I remember reading about the uh, skeletal remains that were uh, covered in Oregon and Washington. The Kennewick. Yeah, and they, everyone was, uh, the people who looked into it said, all the evidence shows that this is <laughs> It was. Uh, yeah, right, so then it kind of changed how people think about the more ancient Yeah, that's a good thing. I think science needs to be challenged. It's, uh, it's like our government needs to be challenged once in a while. It's a check and balance system. Yeah, but there wasn't so much money involved. I think things would have gone better with that. Uh, and uh, I was just lucky enough back in the 60s to major not only in wildlife biology and writing, but also in anthropology. <laughs> so now that I've retired, I'm a full-time anthropologist and, uh, and a poet. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about archaeology through poetry. But I want to talk to you also about the environmental impacts on um, Ohio's archaeology. And I was asked to talk about the mound builders uh, specifically. So let me just lay down some groundwork. Um, who were the mound builders? Uh, it depends what university you went to <laughs> and what professor you studied under. But basically, those were the people who spent a lot of time in prehistory building Indian mounds, building mounds. In Ohio, and I, I would like to be able to point to Newark, and I would like to be able to point to Chillicothe, but I can't because there were more mounds in other places in Ohio than just those two areas. Uh, those two areas happen to be a real consolidation of mounds, specific types of mound works, and um, which kind of almost indicate a religious center getting closer to the religious. Which back then, religion and government were one in the same uh, structures of those people. So, uh, the bottom line here is this the number of mounds that are here today in Ohio versus 200 years ago, day and night. And there's problems and there's reasons for that. Um, if you are on government land, state land, city or municipal land, you can't cannot touch an Indian mound, a prehistoric Indian mound. But if it's on your land, if you're a private sector of America, of Ohio, you can dig them, you can do whatever you want. And the problem that we faced for years wasn't just landowners you know, digging in a mound or giving you or me or you permission to come in and dig it and see what was there. Um, the problem was people needed to farm. And these mounds were just sticking out in the middle of their fields. And, and they were fun for a while, and they were interesting for a while, but, but they just kept degradating those and, and mowing and cutting and plowing, and they just began to seriously disappear all over the place. In uh, Coshocton County, for an example, the number of Adena mounds that were uh, either moved off or, or flattened by farmers, uh, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50, and we don't even have an idea beyond that how many more 
So, one of the things that I, I want to take a look at about the mound builders and the mounds in Ohio are the environmental issues that they have to face and deal with daily. Um, in West Virginia, you have a thing that's called mountaintop mining, where they found out it's cheaper just to take the whole top of a mountain off, systematically remove it, and bring the coal out of the ground. Well, that's fine for mining, but it's not for archaeology. Because we're finding that there's elevations on these hills in Ohio, southeast Ohio, or down in West Virginia, or Kentucky, or Tennessee, where these people seriously live, and where their villages and where their uh, uh, their gatherings were. And those are being watched rapidly in West Virginia. In Ohio, we had strip mining. And I'm going to give you one example of, of a serious environmental issue that, that archaeology and the mounds have faced. Uh, in Harrison County, uh, that's a that's a Ohio River uh, county, um, definitely east of us. The uh, uh, a field collector who collected arrowheads knew a guy that worked for this mining company and said, "Hey, we're going to be stripping this area in about a month." And he said, well, gosh, I heard there's a lot of arrowheads coming up off that area and some bones and all kinds of stuff. He said, well, I'm just telling you, in a month, this whole area is going to be mined. The way the laws were set up in Ohio is that when you go in and you do something like this, you're supposed to bring in a contract archaeologist to do a very quick survey of the area and establish if there's burials or not. If there's burials, then we're looking at internments. We're looking and in bringing in the um, historic Native American uh, Indians to help out with that. They decided, like most mining operations, out of sight, is out of mind. If you see it, don't tell it. Just keep on digging, keep on plowing, keep on bulldozing. And such was the case there. He got permission from one of the mining operators. You can come in. You can follow our bulldozers. You've got two weeks. To do whatever you want to do, but then you're out of here and you may not tell anybody about this. So he had two weeks and he was able to dig up 84 graves, which um, his estimation was there were probably close to 500 burials on this site. Which, once the bulldozing began, they were all just pushed right off the area and gone for literally forever. That, that's a good question. Why didn't he do that? Two reasons. Number one, a mining operation can be shut down until the, the contract archaeologists come in and do their work. In the Columbus area, I worked on one of these. On, uh, do you know where Scioto Downs is? Route 23, the, the uh, water plant that's down there. They hired contract archaeologists to come in and do surveys before they could expand the, the sewage um, recycling plant, basically, is what it was. And so a very limited amount of time to go in there and do a very quick survey and see if there were burials. We ran out of time, didn't get it all done, did the best we could, and then they built the ethanol plant. And that's something that I want to talk a little bit more about, environmental impacts. Um, the problem is, when you stop, uh, and I'm trying to give you both sides of the story, when you stop industry, when you stop a place like this, they have contracts. They still have to pay their people. And the problem is they've not been able to negotiate with, with the government and with the, the, uh, the archaeologists to find a middle of the road way to do this, that they can continue their work and um, get the archaeology information that they need. So now, with strip mines but gravel pits is the other big one, um, because there's a lot of, a tremendous amount of burials in gravel pits, but no longer are the uh, gravel pit people talking about anything. They just keep on, if you see it, you didn't see it, just keep on digging, keep on bringing the gravel out. And it's tough, it's a dilemma, and it has not been solved. And that is that is a significant problem. That, uh, so basically what you're saying is that the economic impact, there's no way you're going to deal with that. Well, I would hope not. I would hope there is a way to deal with it, and but try to get people to sit down and talk about it. That's tough. Who's going to do it? The archaeologists, the mining industry, or the government? You know, and who do you trust? You know, where are you going to get the help? Well, the government doesn't care about those. Well, 
that is one environmental issue that we have to deal with with our, our, our prehistory in Ohio. Um, so we're looking at uh, the, the, the effects of either strip mining or coal mining and the number of mounds and village sites that are just randomly disappearing before we even get to document it. And the, the, the billions of information that we've lost is, is astronomical. Um, I also want to mention some of the other uh, things that are having an impact on, on Ohio's archaeology specifically. There's a science now called flint napping. People who make arrowheads, uh, they actually go out and they dig flint and then they, they make them. Uh, so that sounds fine and dandy and most of us would say, well, yeah, that's cool, right on. The problem is, one man in particular in Holmes County, uh, Roy Miller, is getting anywhere from 500 to $10,000 a piece for these arrowheads that he's making. And he's selling them as reproductions. There's not a problem there. But the flint that he's using um, happens to be Flint Ridge Flint from the Newark area. And that's a very limited area where the flint was pushed very close to the surface. So um, he has been able to buy some of that property and went in with his backhoe, and he's taken out one whole ridge top with his backhoe, digging, destroying the flint pits that the prehistoric people dug um, so that he can extirpate the, uh, the flint that he needs to make his artifacts. Well, legally, he's working complete within the laws. Um, ethically, I don't know. It's a serious problem that we face. In Ohio, there's probably two, maybe three counties where 90% of all the flint was dug to make most of the Indian artifacts. Coshocton is definitely one. Lincoln County is definitely two. And just a touch in Tuscarawas, a touch in Holmes County. But the big center is Coshocton, where a huge amount of strip mining took place years back and just scraped it all away. So we're looking at things that are seriously inundating uh, problems that, that archaeologists face. Um, I wrote a couple more down just to tantalize our thinking. I want to say current farming practices. Um, that's getting pretty close to, to apple pie, hot dogs, and, and uh, baseball <laughs> when, when you're talking farmers. That, that's the heartland of, of America, heartland of Ohio. Who's going to tell the farmers what they can or can't do? Um, I don't have an answer for that, but as an archaeologist, I can tell you that it impacts Ohio's archaeology in a very significant way. A, random grazing of cattle, where they are in and out of streams, rivers, anytime they want indiscriminate grazing, what does it do? It destroys stream banks, which is horrendous. It's hellacious in creating erosion and the, the brown rivers that you see after rainstorms. Um, guess where most of the prehistoric people can't? right on the edges of the rivers and the, the larger streams, the small streams. So we, we are losing myriads of, of campsites, village sites, to, to this type of grazing. Um, who's got the answer? Who's got the solution? I don't know. I'm just sharing some of the problems that we face as archaeologists. Um, I would like to say the Native Americans, bless their hearts, um, and, and it's not all of them, it happens to be a very powerful minority that has convinced Congress that they own all the prehistoric artifacts in North America. But fortunately, uh, and I don't mind sharing this, uh, a thing called DNA was discovered a while back. And with DNA, we can track skeletal remains and go backwards in time and follow the movement. And with this, uh, this discovery of DNA, we've been able to look at the movement of prehistoric people throughout North America. When most of us were in school, we were taught that, that it's called a, a place they called Pharyngia, or the, uh, Alaska, Russia, that most of the people came that way. And that was pretty standard, and that was everybody believed it. But they couldn't find any artifacts to substantiate it. Okay, this is where the people came from, but oh, by the way, we just can't find anything they left behind. But for 20, for at least 20 uh, millennia, they were traveling this direction. Well, you know, that's a lot of people for a lot of time, and they should have lost, dropped, camped, villaged a lot of stuff. So every time we, we press ourselves to keep archaeologists honest and, and what we're discovering, it's interesting the, the problems we're running into. Now the, the belief is that well, all that 
area they travel has fallen into the ocean. So we have no more evidence that these people come that way. I'm, said, I'm sorry, that's not scientific and I can't buy that. Um, and then things come up like the Kennewick Man, and that's a skeleton that was found out west um, in the northwest along a large river. And the interesting thing about this skeleton was A, he had a lancelet in his um, uh, hip and the bone had healed, but it was a crippling, a disabling uh, problem that this man had. And the uh, fluted uh, paleo point that was sticking in him goes back to about 12,000 BC. Well, that's, that's exciting because we don't have any skeletons of people back that far. And Kennewick didn't date that one. Pardon? Kennewick didn't date that one. I think he was more like 9,000 BC, wasn't he? Even though, even though we don't have any skeletons in North America, in America, on the West Coast that go back to that time period, very exciting. And the origins of the skeleton or the DNA got even more exciting because they weren't necessarily from Asia as more as they were connected to, to Europe. And it's startling to look at the skull uh, and compared to other skulls. Well, here's the, the um, another problem that surfaced. It was on government land, basically, where it was found. So who has control of this? Well, you know, archaeologists are jumping on this immediately. They want to get some documentation, and they were given a very small period of time to do all the research they could, and then um, the Native Americans demanded that the skeleton be in turn reburied, and which the Corps of Engineers was very glad to do, and they put hundreds of millions of pounds of riprap on this, wherever they buried the skeleton, and we don't know where it is. Bottom line was, there was so much research that needed, wanted, and could have been done, but you're dealing with a lot of opinions and a lot of uh, unsolved issues. You've got government, you've got Native American uh, rights, and then you have the archaeological, the scientific world. Trying to pull those together, it creates problems. Um, if uh, the only really control, and, and I say that with respect, that it's neither good nor bad, but it is essential on archaeology that we have, like here in Ohio, is on any government land, state, uh, municipalities, federal land, Army Corps of Engineers, Muskingum Watershed, areas like that, technically you're not allowed to pick up a thing. It belongs to that government agency. And in terms of Indian artifacts, it stands. You cannot dig any of those areas without getting permission from the appropriate agency. So that slows down the amount of work that's being done on these areas. Um, another uh, problem that I've seen throughout the state of Ohio is if you um, just go out to Fountain Square and get a map of all the oil and gas wells in the state of Ohio, and you track where they are, the elevations that they're coming from in the counties, interestingly enough, they're on the same level of a lot of village sites. And they, they for whatever reason, weren't being uh, held accountable for a long time when they went in and uh, were do doing their drilling. Um, and you'll find them very often on areas where the natural gas wells are, there are Indian artifacts, substantial amount of artifacts and pottery, which indicates village sites. So all of these things are some of the environmental issues that we deal with. Let's look at a couple more. Um, there's a, a thing called ammonium nitrate that is needed. It's a nitrogen that farmers use to put back into their fields to regenerate so they can get successful crops. And here's the, the problem with that is it's a very acidic acid. And uh, prehistoric bones do not stand up to that stuff. And a uh, classic example for us is up in Portage County, where we have, um, there are mounds everywhere up there, and burials up there. And the one field where the farmer has been farming for a long time, uh, using ammonium nitrate, then the other side of the fence is orchard. And the archaeologists went in, got permission to take a look at this. And the skeletal remains were nearly all gone on the side where the ammonium nitrate is being applied. In the orchard area, everything's intact. There were extended burials, and they were just still there. Um, farming technique, you know, who's gonna step in? Who's gonna say, who's gonna do what? Um, you can't. Uh, I want to also mention some current uh, archeological techniques 
that we have today that we didn't have a while back that are extremely exciting. It was a an unspoken, semi-written agreement that when mounds were going to be looked at and dug, that technology is leaping so fast that if you go in and you excavate a mound um, and, and uh, 20 years from now, the technology that we've discovered that could have given us more information, we've lost all of it because we took out the entire mound. So there was a, a period of time where universally uh, archaeologists were not doing entire mounds, they were doing half of a mound or a third of a mound and going in and looking at this stuff. So what kind of techniques, what kind of technology do we have? Well, there's a, a flotation uh, technique that we have where we can take dirt and sand and uh, take the, uh, put it in water, collect stuff that floats off of it, pollen, seeds. We can tell you what was going on. We found out that the Hopewell people turned out to be um, not so much uh, the people that we initially thought they were, that they were actually doing some significant farming. And we never would have known that had it not been for these flotation devices. Another cool thing that, that has come into um, our current hands is a, um, uh, it's called a magnetometer. But there's three different types of devices that you can either hand hold or manipulate across the ground. And by the way, did you know that your front yard is an Indian map? So, the other thing, too, I heard a lecture last year uh, down in uh, what's the state park near King's Island? That has, I wanted you to look and see what they're like. Imagine cutting up your dinner or cutting your fiber or trying to make clothing and using these types of knives, among other things. So, good questions. Um, also, I brought my book with me. If anybody's interested, I'll talk to you about that. Bob Converse, a man with integrity, brilliant, um, no personal bias. It's just absolutely in love with Ohio's prehistory. Brought it home made it accessible to you, to me, to the lay people who want to learn more about archaeology. Pictures, you can see what a dig site looks like with young people there digging, a uh, garbage pit, whoopee, <laughs> and, uh, and me. So I will stick around for a little bit if you would like to ask a little bit more and you want some really defined answers to some of that, I can help. Um, but thanks. Thanks for hanging out with me, you guys. I appreciate that. Um, I very dearly in love with those people. <laughs>